Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition today, as always, also on Comcast, Channel 15 and AT&T, Channel 99 in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills in the village of Franklin on Birmingham area municipal access. Also on the radio, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff out of Bloomfield Hills. And today, as always, online, civiccentertv.com, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15, and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And as always, joining me today on the show from her home studios in Kegel Harbor is Ronnie Dahl. Tyler, happy Tuesday to you. Yes, happy Tuesday, Ronnie. Uh, I totally forgot until I just saw someone post something on Facebook. Get out and vote today. Yes, it is election day here in West Bloomfield. For those in the West Bloomfield School District and other places around the state of Michigan that are holding uh, smaller elections, but still important elections today, you may be able to vote. So if that is the ca- if that is the case and you're not sure if you are a registered or eligible to vote in certain elections, of course, contact your clerk's office. And here in West Bloomfield, you can go ahead and contact the clerk's office over at West Bloomfield Township all day long today to see if, uh, if you were, well, not all day long, but while the polls are open, to see if you're eligible. And uh, if you think you may have been eligible but aren't sure what the election is, it's all about and where your precinct may be. You can get all that information from Debbie Binder and her team over at the West Bloomfield Clerk's Office. So for us here in the West Bloomfield area, today's bond issue is just for the people that live uh, in the West Bloomfield School District area. So it can be a little confusing for some of the people like Sylvan Lake because most of that city is in the Pontiac School District. So, uh, but completely forgot and it's easy for people to kind of skip over these smaller elections uh, because there's not a lot of hoopla surrounding the election. And I do wonder too, is that one of the reasons why um, they put some of these issues on the ballot? Typically they're surrounding millages or bonds uh, on some of these smaller elections because that can kind of really drum up the people that are either, you know, really for the bond or the millage, they are the ones that tend to uh, take the time to go to the polls today. Yeah, people that are, are paying attention to these more local issues, these vitally important issues that really, more than anything else, are the are directly affecting you and your community. They put these on these ballots to make sure that people that are actually paying attention to these events or and these uh, to these uh, ballot proposals and are doing their their due diligence are going out and voting, whether they're for it or against it. Whereas in more uh, major elections like the midterms or the presidential elections every four years, where these ballot proposals are still there and they're, uh, they're usually typically down ballot or near the end of a ballot especially if it's multiple pages and in many cases at that point people are missing them because by the time they're getting there they're they're fatigued going through every single different candidate and they really haven't ma- maybe paid attention to these are to these proposals and have just left them blank so in these more uh, smaller elections where they're a single ballot issue or a couple of ballot issues uh, at play you're getting a lot more engagement there and more likely that people will actually get to those parts. So that's why we see a lot of these in these smaller, so to speak, but still very important elections that affect your direct community. Well, if anything, we've uh, all come to realize during this pandemic just how important some of these uh, super local Mm -hmm. uh, issues can be to us and how they do impact us on a daily basis. So if you live in the West Bloomfield School District, get out and vote today i wonder if they're going to be handing out stickers they might i think they would at at, at the open polls i mean that's that's tradition sticker stickers aren't spread in COVID 19 they're not going to be like here let's breathe directly into our into each other's mouths so that we can celebrate voting they're going to hand out stickers it's a lot safer tyler some of the things i'm like what What are you talking about my brain works in mysterious ways ronnie i I, I, sometimes i sometimes I, i think the same thing like what the heck did i just think right there (laughs) so but we do want to encourage people to uh always exercise your right uh, to vote because uh you know it's been a battle it's been a long fight for you to have that right so uh take two minutes the polls are not going to be busy you can pop in and pop out i would imagine within minutes so uh swing by your local polling place today and uh um, vote uh with that uh you know what else is happening today uh, tyler 
uh, starting today, Ford Field, uh, their mass COVID-19 vaccine clinic is going to be switching to the Johnson & Johnson. So as Detroit's Ford Field enters its final weeks as a federally operated mass COVID-19 vaccination site, it will switch from giving the Pfizer two-dose vaccine to the Johnson & Johnson's one-dose shot. So the J&J vaccine will be available starting today to anyone 18 and older who has yet to receive a first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, it is going to be continued to be offered through May 17th. Walk-ups will be available 8.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, daily starting today, although people are still encouraged to register in advance by te uh, texting rather in COVID to 75049 or by calling the State Health Department's COVID-19 hotline 888-535-6136. And just so you know, if you text the end COVID, you get a link to Meyer for you to fill out a quick questionnaire and then they'll get back in touch with you. So anyone seeking a walk-up vaccine should enter Ford Field through Gate G. People who got a first dose of the Pfizer vaccine uh, can also still go to Ford Field to get a second dose. And uh, here is a, a, an important point. It doesn't matter where you got your first dose. So you can do that through May 17th as well. Uh, it just remember it needs to be at least 21 days um, since your first dose of the Pfizer. So people seeking a second dose are advised to bring their vaccination cards with them to the site. Of course, this continues to be the big push to get as many people vaccinated here in the state of Michigan as possible. Yeah, and, and having the Johnson & Johnson vaccine be back in play at Ford Field, it, it gives more opportunity to get people through the vaccination process a lot quicker because it's a single dose vaccine. And so those that have been waiting for Johnson & Johnson specifically, so they don't have to go back for two separate appointments and get two shots in their arms, they just get one. This might entice them to get back out there and get into the vaccine process. And uh, of course we have the controversy recently where the Johnson Johnson vaccine was pulled uh, out of the public briefly as the CDC and the FDA addressed a very, very rare uh, situation with, with, uh, blood, cl with blood clots uh, as a complication in, in very few cases, less than 10 and in, in over 6 mil million, nearly 7 million cases now having this back into the public and now back in the mass vaccination sites. Hopefully that'll help to give a little bit of a spark to what's been a little bit of a lull in Michigan's vaccine efforts. Yeah, I did see one study where uh, most Americans, uh, the news about the blood clots did not concern them mm -hmm. and they can plan on continuing to go forward with their J&J &J vaccine. But uh, news just came out uh, late yesterday that there was a lady from Grand Rapids. Uh, she, I believe she was like 38 and her family believes that she died after getting the J&J &J vaccine. Yeah, and if that is the case, and of course we don't have that 100% confirmed uh, just yet, but if that is the case, that's an unfortunate situation. And, and uh, obviously our thoughts would be with that family. Again, these are very rare cases, uh, very less than, less than 10 and almost 7 million of these vaccines administered here in the U.S. So Johnson & Johnson is back out there and uh, it is generally safe. There's these cases rare cases and complications happen with any vaccine and with any medication um, and in this case it's been extremely rare so obviously it's a tragic situation we've talked before about this too ronnie maybe this is a situation where the federal government because there is such encouragement to get these vaccines should have a system in place where yes these are very rare cases that you have complications but should there be complications you're doing a community service we want to make sure that we're there for you in your time of need as you're helping out people in our countries and our world's time of need as well. Yeah, it, it'd be interesting to see if that um, discussion continues further as we get um, a little bit further down the line into the vaccine process. You know, one thing that is going to help us get to that herd immunity, uh, trying to get more of the younger people mm -hmm. vaccinated. So we've been talking about this Pfizer vaccine for adolescents is expected to get FDA approval possibly uh, this week. So it is likely FDA is going to uh, authorize the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for adolescents within the next week. So far, the vaccines haven't been approved for use in adults and older teens. So the FDA authorization would allow the Pfizer shots to be given to 12 to 15 year olds for the first time, 
once the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also signs off. So many parents have been waiting for the vaccines for their kids, hoping that it would allow them to get back to some type of normal, um, you know, letting them feel more comfortable to return to the classrooms, but also so many of the events and the sporting events that go around being a kid. So the FDA is expected to modify its emergency use authorization uh, within the next week to allow younger adolescents to receive the shot. The other two authorized vaccines here in the States, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, are so far only allowed to be used in adults. So Moderna, though, is testing its vaccine in adolescents and younger children. J&J &J plans to, but has not yet started that process. So, um, and we have seen, uh, even with the Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J, &J, once that approval comes through, typically they can start uh, giving out those shots uh, pretty immediately. And especially here in the state of Michigan, where the younger populations during this most recent surge have really been the problem area here in, in the state as far as new COVID cases. And with all the problems that have been had in schools with switching back and forth between virtual learning and in-person learning for school districts, having to balance getting that extra state funding by having a bare minimum of 20 hours of in-person instruction each week, getting these kids vaccinated, getting to a herd immunity point within these school districts is going to be vital for, for a lot of these school districts and getting the critical funding that they need coming off of a year that was really just uh, struck by COVID-19 problems across the board and a lot of extra funding that didn't necessarily get their way for one circumstance or another and th that they lost over the course of the year. And especially as they're going forward and having to make up for this new normal that we're going to be seeing in schools with a lot more virtual learning options with a lot of teachers having retired and these school districts needing to replace them, being able to have in-person learning that gets them that extra funding through the state of Michigan that the federal government siphoned down to the state may be critical and getting the kids vaccinated so that they can have safe in-person learning for the majority of the week if not back to full normal would be a huge step so this is definitely news that i think school districts parents and students are Good going morning. to be very welcome to we have someone of course, joining our uh, zoom we'll, we'll get to our first guest in uh, just a few minutes for now we ask them to mute as we continue our headlines so with that, um, I'm sure uh, you saw this headline yesterday, uh, Michigan Health Department uh, today, Tyler, in response to Shirky yesterday, now coming out this morning saying 70% of the vaccination goal is not based on herd immunity. So Michigan's target of vaccinating 70% of the adult population, not based on reaching herd immunity, a spokesperson for the uh, state health department said, as a key Republican lawmaker question, why those who are recovered from the virus are included in the tally. So during a Monday radio interview, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky credited the governor for setting a metric-based uh, reporting plan, but a reopening plan rather, but argued that the plan should take into account people who have already had the virus. Shirky said the state should be opening this week. So however, the 70% target is not based on community immunity or herd immunity. According to the spokesperson for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, it's an operational goal identified at the beginning of the vaccination campaign based on the understanding of potential availability of vaccine and ages that would be eligible for vaccination. So there's not enough information currently available to say if or for how long after an infection someone is protected from COVID-19. So early evidence suggests natural immunity from COVID-19 may not last very long, but more studies of course are needed to better understand the virus. And so because of that, people who have already had the virus but haven't been vaccinated are included in that 70% calculation number. Yeah, and, and once again, this is another example of Senator Shirky not exactly being responsible with his words. Uh, we've seen that in numerous different cases regarding COVID-19 and regarding other issues in the past several months and past couple of years. And this is one of those situations where maybe it's better to ask that to the, to the scientific community instead of bringing that question out there to the public and possibly leading people with misinformation. So uh, luckily that was corrected and at least we have some clarification because to some extent it is a valid question, but maybe it's not something to bring out in the way that Senator Shirky did. 
Uh, so with that, as a reminder, you can always find the latest headlines. Just go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus, and the headlines are posted there each and every morning. <clears throat> also, we want to try to make uh, a little bit easier for you as well. At the top of the page, you'll find direct links to valuable resources such as the CDC. You'll want to keep an eye on that website uh, because they do post the latest information, uh, including some of the travel restrictions. We know that... Um, uh, travel restrictions are in place right now to India. Those just started. So you'll find that on the CDC website, but also we have a link to the state of Michigan as well as Oakland County. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we have a great show ahead for you on this Tuesday edition of the Megacast. Um, right after the break, when we come back, we'll be speaking with the vice president for the Troy Chamber of Commerce. They have an in-person event coming up. We'll talk about that more and so much more here next on the Megacast. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development, three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In times like these, we have to believe in each other. And we believe that you'll do the right thing. When it comes to stopping the spread of COVID. Follow the three W's. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. And when it's your turn to get the vaccine, take your shot. It all comes down to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We're so close, Michigan. We can do this together. Welcome back to the Tuesday edition of the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios alongside Mr. Tyler Keefe as he holds things down back in West Bloomfield. You know, for so many businesses, this is kind of a hopeful time for them because um, we're starting to talk now, not so much about closures, but reopening the state of Michigan. And that is good news for so many of these businesses. It has been such a struggle over the past year, but helping them navigate all of the ups and downs are Chambers of Commerce, and that includes the Troy Chamber of Commerce. So let's bring in Sheila Denstedt. She's the vice president over at the Troy Chamber of Commerce. Sheila, great to have you with us. Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate you having me. Uh, so I would imagine uh, the, converse, uh, the conversation is starting to shift a little bit with some of the businesses now that we're starting to be more focused on reopening the state of Michigan. Are they hopeful right now? They're hopeful. They've been hopeful throughout. So yes, more hopeful now. But um, we talk about all the time how excited we've been from the standpoint of watching our members pivot through all of this. It was an initial shock at the beginning and then they just adapted. And we've seen some really great things. We've seen members supporting members. We've seen members supporting the community. And now, yes, more hope um, through so many factors. So yeah, it's been great. So with that, Sheila, I know that uh, so many chambers were hoping that the governor was going to lift the restrictions on returning employees to the offices. It didn't happen, it was extended. However, 
we do have a new plan in place to try to return to normal. And there were some metrics set there about vaccinations. What's been the response from the business community? Um, from what we've heard, everybody's going to abide by what came from Lansing, and we're all just going to look to move forward um, as things progress. So there's, again, there's still hope. We're still moving forward. Our restaurants, our businesses, our hotels are all moving forward. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, hopefully sooner than later. Fingers crossed. And I do think, too, like, especially when it comes to the restaurants, there's been so much focus on restaurants, but we know this has impacted every business uh, out there. And, um, but here in the state of Michigan, when we start to get warmer weather and sunshine, it just makes it feel better. Oh, in every way possible. Every one of our restaurants in Troy has some facet of outdoor dining. Um, we've done it a few times. There's nothing better than sit outside on Big Beaver and watch the cars drive by, convertibles, everybody happy, the smiles the warmth. So yeah, it's definitely been good that there's been a turn in the weather. I was in Troy uh, last week in that new, um, uh, right there under Big Beaver uh, in 75, where they, you know, the construction is going on, but they realigned that intersection. I get so confused. I'm like, where am I going? I don't want to get back on the highway. It's a momentary trip to Europe because you're driving on the wrong side of the road. Yes, it's, it's great. It's open and it has alleviated traffic. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. So um, one thing I think that's been great about the pandemic, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this, is when so many of our businesses were really struggling, our elected leaders responded in different ways just some of the simple things of allowing curbside or opening up patios and parking lots where outside of a pandemic, those conversations probably wouldn't have made it past stage one. Do you think these relationships that have been built over the past year will continue and that open dialogue will continue as well? I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've been very excited. Oakland County stepped up. They helped a lot of the communities through some grant funding for those things, for heaters, for hand sanitizers, for the outside dining aspect. Absolutely. Our hospitality committee um, has received a lot of help from, this, from officials in our area. And yes, it's been a great dialogue and it definitely helped move them forward and keep them going through all the craziness. What's it been like for some of the businesses trying to apply for these grants and loans? It's, uh, it can be confusing and overwhelming. It can be, and we are blessed as a chamber that we have a lot of our members who have helped each other out. So whenever there's been a struggle, we've been able to navigate with them, either helping them walk through the process or putting them in touch with someone who can. We've been posting our grants left and right on our website. We've been emailing them out. There's one out now for the restaurants. We're making sure that they know about that through the SBA. Um, we're there to help. We're a conduit for them. So it, it's been great. And again, our members have stepped up and helped each other. So with that, um, you just mentioned, Sheila, um, the SBA loan. We know in the past history has been the need is so much greater than the available funds. Do you anticipate that's going to be the same case um, under this new grant program? Well, it's 28.6 billion. So I hope that it, it, everyone's able to apply. I, I wish I could give you an answer. There, there is definitely a need and the need outweighs the dollar, but they continue to put more dollars forward. So we can only be helpful, hopeful that that continues. We're talking with Sheila Dinstadt. She's the vice president for the Troy Chamber of Commerce. And we should mention too, by the way, you got a promotion in the middle of this pandemic because uh, you were director of business development. Now you're the vice president. What's it been like for you? I officially started last week. So it really hasn't changed all that much, but um, it's been great. I've been very fortunate. I've been with the chamber almost 11 years. I was a chamber member before. Um, it's a great group of people. It keeps me going. It's kept me sane during all this craziness, believe it or not. So with that, Sheila, um, what advice do you give to uh, other 
people in a similar situation, like how do you transition from one role to another? And for so many people, they're still working remotely. It's a, it's a great question. Um, you just keep plugging forward. You, I've been involved. We're a great group. We're about five people. So we've all had our hands in each other's, you know, dealings. So we, we know what's going on. It was a very easy transition. I'm very fortunate that our um, vice president, our prior vice president is still going to be there so she can help me out when needed. So it's just leaning on people, leaning, making sure you have the right people surrounding you. You go to the right people with questions. I was on your website and I see that you guys are doing an actual in-person yeah. event on May 11th. Yes. Tell us more about that. Very excited. It's a morning coffee at the Embassy Suites in Troy. All protocols will be followed. I have to put that out there. And um, the feedback's been wonderful. People are very excited. It's one step closer to a bit of normalcy. Yeah, it's so funny, like, because to say in person, <laughs> we get so excited. Who thought we would get so excited to go have coffee with uh, people? <laughs> Well, it is. And if you find yourself when you have that opportunity to be in person, you just talk. You may not even know what you're talking about, but you're just talking because you're so excited to be in front of people. So uh, tell us about the business community in Troy. Um, are, do we have some new businesses opening? Because we do know, yes. despite the support from the community, some have not been able to keep their doors open. It is true. There, there are a few that have closed, but yes, we've had probably five or six restaurants and or other businesses open. Oakland Orthodontics just opened recently. Clean Eats, a restaurant over on Big Beaver just opened. We've probably had seven or eight ribbon cuttings within the last month. Um, so yes, there are a lot of businesses open. We have a ribbon cutting tomorrow at Aldana's Mexican restaurant on Coolidge and Maple. So there are a lot of great things happening. What a hard time to open a restaurant, not only because of the restrictions, but the staffing shortage uh, that is going on right now. Yes, that is true. A lot, it's not just in the restaurant world. Every business is finding some facet of that happening. Our hoteliers are also having issues there. But again, they're moving forward. They're looking at ways to bring people in, be it signing bonuses, be it you know higher wages. They are all working towards that. We've incorporated a jobs board on our website. We're encouraging people to post jobs and to come look for jobs there too. So what is the greatest need that you're seeing? What industry other than restaurants? Hoteliers. Hoteliers yeah. and most retail. Wow. And I will say, talking about retail, um, I was in Somerset a few weeks ago. It was like a big old party in there. I was like, it didn't seem like uh, people were struggling. They were definitely shopping right now. Again, people have been pent up. There's pent up shopping aggression when you think about it. There are people who want to shop and me being one of them and you want to go out and, and there's some great deals right now. So definitely and definitely support local. Look at your local community and a lot of the local stores. They definitely need everyone to come out. Sheila Dinset with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the vice president for the Troy Chamber of Commerce. Sheila, if we could shift the um, focus just a little bit, can I ask you about vaccines and what you're hearing from some of your business um, members. Do they anticipate that vaccines are going to be required for some people to come back to the office? Or at this point in time, they're just recommending it? Very honestly, we haven't discussed that very much. We, uh, we haven't had the time to do that yet. I haven't heard much about it. I'm going to make some assumptions that they're going to follow whatever is set forth by Lansing, but it's not something that has come up that much for us. We're looking, we've been talking more about the employment struggles and the funding struggles. Yeah. And with that, I it really, such a tough time to be a, a business owner right now, because you're still juggling and trying to navigate so many of these different pieces of the puzzle. Absolutely. And there are so many things to navigate. You now have business owners who, again, I go back to the restaurants, but they're now the host, they're the dishwasher, they're the cook, they're navigating so many things, trying to continue the marketing efforts to get the word out there. Hoteliers doing the same. Some of our hoteliers have worked seven days straight, 
24 hours a day, it seems like. So yeah, there, there's a lot of navigating. I think that's we, the best way to put it. Yeah, and we've heard so much about that word pivot throughout this yes. pandemic. Uh, I think we would all be happy when we come out of this to not have to say pivot again for a long time. Absolutely. But we are still in the middle of the pandemic. How important has it been for some of your members and other businesses to really reach out and communicate and build relationships with other businesses um, throughout the area? I've, that has been key. Um, again, since March 6th, or was it March 16th when this started last year, or networking has been huge and finding ways to do it um, has been huge. And we, at one point, were putting on one networking event a week and we found we were having 50, 60 people. A, they just wanted to see people and B, they wanted to connect for that reason. They needed help. They needed a way to contact each other. And I think chambers throughout Oakland County found that and moved forward with different avenues and trying to be inventive with it so it didn't become stagnant or boring. So networking has remained and will remain key throughout the rest of this year into next. So with that, Sheila, if I can ask, we hope to find silver linings throughout this crisis. What has been a silver lining uh, for the chamber there and members of your team? There's been a silver lining. I think it's just a lot of it, I go back to they're supporting each other, the restaurants reaching out to Beaumont to bring them food, um, being sites to drop out when, just drop items off when PPE was needed places. They were stepping up for each other. We've had folks pivot, I use the word pivot, but they <laughs> started creating PPP items and, and it was just, it was, a true community. And we're, again, very proud of our members for recognizing that and it's just stepping up. Yeah, it really is about uh, relationships throughout the pandemic. And I know a lot of businesses too that maybe didn't have curbside have developed that and will probably keep it a post pandemic as well, or even you know online ordering and social media has really been such a vital tool throughout the pandemic and social media can be a little bit intimidating for some older people. We call them more seasoned professionals. <laughs> um, yes, but it's been great that some of our younger professionals have stepped up to help. Um, we've seen it in networking events. Co questions have come up and you'll see someone going, oh, no, 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 try this, do it this way, this will help you. And then they've had conversations after the events. So again, I go back to that community, that family that want to help each other and make sure everyone succeeds. Sheila Dinsett with us here on the MegaCast. She's the vice president for the Troy Chamber of Commerce. Sheila, just another minute or two. Uh, anything else maybe I didn't ask that you want to touch on that's going on over at the chamber? Um, well, we are in the hiring process right now to fill my role that we just left. So that's very exciting. So there's some new um, fresh faces that will be coming out soon. And again, we're just moving forward, looking at ways to do hybrid events so that we can make sure everybody's able to attend. And we got a lot of good things, a lot of happenings in Troy. Keep an eye on our Facebook page and our website to keep up on those and come out and support Troy businesses. Most definitely. And let's really hope that the, the huge push to support local continues past okay, the you. pandemic as well, because we know that it's the small businesses that it's going to take them much longer to recover and they make our communities unique. So let's hope that continues. I see it happening. I think it will. And I agree. I agree. Sheila, we so appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate you too. And congratulations on the promotion. Thank you so much. Again, uh, if you want more information, just visit the Troy Chamber of Commerce. There's so much information on their website, so check it out uh, if you want to find out more or how to connect with the Chamber and other businesses as well. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Still a lot to get to in the next hour. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the Director for Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way here in Southeast Michigan. This is the Megacast. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys 
I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping, taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now there are vaccines and they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now get the facts. Learn more at getvaccineanswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios. Mr. Tyler Keith holding things down back there for us in West Bloomfield. As a reminder, we are here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. You can catch us on civiccentertv.com, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Uh, if you have a cable, thank you. You'll find us channel 15 on Comcast 99 with AT&T. You can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff, as well as follow us on our Facebook page, Civic Center TV, 89.3 Lakes FM. That's what makes up the mega cast. Tyler, do you remember uh, way back in the beginning? How did you guys come up with all the platforms? Uh, that was something that was discussed really early on, wanting to make sure that we could get to everybody possible in, in all different outlets so that if we were going to people live, of course, people are going to watch television live to listen to the radio as they're driving through town at this time of day. And then, of course, online if they're in the office or if they're at home or people listen to podcasts uh, during during their workday also. Have it be in a podcasted form uh, as well, or on the web and available to people on demand. So just trying to get it in as many formats as possible so that no matter which you prefer, you can get access to this information readily. So of course it uh, grew out of the pandemic. Tyler and Dave Scott started the show, thought it was going to be a couple weeks, maybe a month, and here we are more than a year later because while we're hopeful that we are uh, coming out of this crisis, we're still in it. It's not over just yet. And really the goal of the show has been and to bring you interviews um, in the long format, long interview format with so many people here in the area as we all continue to navigate uh, this crisis. And uh, with that, we want to go ahead and bring in uh, Cassie Therfelder. She is the uh, lawyer, but also the director of advocacy and government relations uh, for the United Way here in Southeast Michigan. And we know United Way Cassie has been such a vital, vital organization to the area throughout this crisis. Uh, yes, thank you, Ronnie. I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you today and talk about, um, you know, the Alice Report and some of the things United Way is doing. But, you know, as we're talking about the COVID um, pandemic, you're right, like, um, we didn't expect it to go on this long. Uh, when, when COVID first began, we immediately started our COVID-19 relief fund, um, expecting that to only go for a few weeks, a few months. And then now, you know, we've been working um, for over a year to try to support households as we experience this both health and economic crisis. So with that, Cassie, um, we also know that United Way uh, is a nonprofit as well. And so what's it been like on the fundraising side? Because you're trying to help as many people, but also you need the donations to keep it going. Yes, absolutely. That's a really great question. Um, you know, we're seeing that our nonprofit partners throughout the region are, are struggling. Um, there's been such a, a great increase in demand for the needs that these nonprofit partners are providing. Um, and they're also seeing that, you know, some of their donations are decreasing because people don't have um, as much flexibility in their income to give to nonprofit organizations. Um, but we are, you know, continuing to uh, provide funds and to receive funds thanks to some really incredible donors who are uh, helping support these, these needs. And so since the beginning of the pandemic, we have been able to award more than $35 million in grants throughout the region, which helps support nonprofit organizations and communities that are providing resources to those who are, you know, living below the Alice threshold, struggling to get by. And um, we have also been able to provide 
uh, more than 350,000 items of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. And um, if you're not familiar with our 211 call center, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a helpline. So it's a, a, if you're experiencing any sort of crisis that's non-medical uh, in nature, you can call this 21, you can call 211 and um, be connected to a community care advocate who will connect you to any services that, uh, services, programs, resources that you're eligible for to help you with that crisis, whether that's, you know, the threat of eviction, or maybe you need to access to diapers or food for your household, um, really anything, we will connect you to the services that you're eligible for. And so we've made more than 93,000 connections um, for through 2 on one since the beginning of the pandemic. And we know that even with all of this, that's that's still not enough. So there are still nonprofits that are desperately in need of funds in order to provide the services people are in need of. And um, you know, there are more calls to one one all the time, uh, people who need services, um, who may or may not be eligible for services in their region. So um, it's it's definitely a struggle. And we're seeing seeing that need continuing to increase. 93,000. That number is really quite staggering. Um, yes. and, and that's just the ones that reached out. You wonder how many other people have not done so. Uh, during this time. Um, I do know you're also the director for the advocacy and government relations. And I want to talk to you more about the Alice report. And um, for those that aren't familiar with it, give us some background. Yes. So the Alice report is a report that's issued every two years by the Michigan Association of United Ways. It stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. Uh, United Ways throughout the country started recognizing that people in our communities were really struggling to make ends meet. But many of these people were working, they were doing everything right, and they still couldn't afford their basic household necessities. So we knew that the federal poverty level just wasn't telling us the whole story. Um, and the ALICE report comes out of that. So the ALICE report really shines a light on the challenges many households are facing and aims to find collaborative solutions to those challenges. Uh, the report uses a standard methodology to assess the actual cost of living or the actual cost of meeting your most basic needs in every county so that we can really have a measure of financial hardship throughout the state and break that down at the local level. Um, so the ELS report looks at key factors for a household's basic needs of food, housing, childcare, healthcare, transportation, technology, and taxes. Um, and we use that to build a bare bones budget. So a really the, the truest bare bones budget we can in order to understand the absolute minimum co uh, cost for a household to meet all of their needs. And that amount is referred to as the Alice survivability threshold. So that's the amount that a household must earn in order to meet all their needs. So that doesn't include any flexibility for saving for emergencies, for medical expenses, for any sort of, of crisis your family might experience. So there's there's really no flexibility there. It's really just that bare bones minimum in order to survive. This is really vital. This is it, such important information because we do know there are so many people that are working full time. They're taking on second jobs and they're still not able to pay that light bill some some months. So with that, what do you do with this information? What's the next step? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, we are really doing our best to get the word out about the report. We want to help people understand um, why that is, why it is that so many people are working, often working two jobs um, and they're barely treading water. They're not able to make all of or meet all their household's needs. Um, so uh, we, we, we share this information with the public, but we also talk to our elected officials about this data. We want them to know what the report says and um, what this means for their community as well. So they can use this to inform their decisions about policy issues that will impact households below the house threshold. Um, and one of the things we really like to help make sure our um, elected officials understand is, you know, when, when we're looking at services and benefits that support households in need, we're often using the federal poverty level to determine whether you are eligible, whether you can qualify for those supports. <clears throat> so um, we're able to show that, you know, we have this actual cost of living developed by the Alice threshold or, or developed by the Alice report, um, that we can really understand what that cost of living is in our region. Um, whereas the federal poverty level <clears throat> is created by comparing pre-tax cash income against the cost of the minimum food diet in 1963. 
updated for inflation. So the federal poverty level is not taking into consideration any actual cost of meeting your household needs. And it doesn't vary based on where you live. And we know that the cost of living, cost of meeting your needs is going to, is going to vary wildly throughout the, the country and throughout our state as well. So um, being able to help explain that to um, you know people who are making decisions about policies and about who's eligible for programs can uh, really help um, understand why so many people above that federal poverty level are in, in need of supports as well. Um, you know, for example, <clears throat> the federal poverty level tells us that a family of four, um, the federal poverty level for a family of four is just over $28,000. But according to the ALICE report, that survivability threshold for that same family of four is actually uh, $64,000. That's more than double the federal poverty level. And that's the gap that we are really advocating for, right? So we know that there are households who are living below that threshold, they're working, they're doing everything right, and um, they're still not able to meet their needs. And this, this helps us understand why. We're talking with uh, Casey Therfelder. She is the director for the advocacy and government relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And we're talking about the Alice report, such an important report. Uh, any new surprises with this latest report versus some of the previous years? Because we should remember too, this doesn't, this is before the pandemic. Yes. So um, I think there are a couple of really interesting facts. So, um, you know, First, like you said, this this report is from is from data from before the pandemic. So the report uses, in order to be as accurate as possible, it uses data that's two years old. So this is data from 2019. That's right before the pandemic began, and um, so that means uh, that this is this is when people. Uh, this is before the pandemic started. So this is also 10 years after we had experienced. Um, economic growth and recovery, right? We've had 10 years of, of economic growth and recovery. We were, we were celebrating a strong economy, low unemployment rates. And right before the pandemic, 38% of households in the state, 38% weren't able to meet all of their basic needs. And so you can only imagine now um, after the pandemic has begun, what that might look like, how many more households are in need. Um, you know, this report, though, also does include a couple of interesting new new um, factors. So it includes a senior survival budget, and it also includes something called the Alice Essentials Index. So um, these are two new pieces for this report. And all of this information can be found on the data center at unitedforalice.org um, if you're interested in learning more about this data. Um, but the senior survival budget is... Um, a breakdown of what it costs for a senior to meet all of their needs. So someone who's over the age of 65, and it adjusts the household survival budget to reflect some of the different expenses or lower costs for seniors. And so what we found is that in 2019, nearly half of all seniors, 65 and older, were living below that Alice threshold. So that means that nearly half of our seniors aren't able to make ends meet. They're making those tough decisions about, you know, skipping a meal and not paying, not not picking up their prescriptions. Um, and so these are are things that we really need to consider um, when we're making decisions about, um, you know, policy decisions. And um, you know, the Alice Essentials Index is that other new piece for this report. And I think this is a really interesting piece because this. Essentials Index measures the change over time in the cost of household essentials uh, versus the Consumer Price Index, which tracks the prices over time on all goods and services. So when we look at just the goods and services that people need to survive, that households absolutely need um, their basic necessities, we see that these essentials increased at a rate of 3.4% annually over the past decade, whereas the Consumer's Price Index inflation was only 1.8%. So um, we're seeing that the cost of goods and services that people need for their household to get by is increasing at a faster rate than other goods and services. And that helps us to understand also, you know, why, why there are so many people who are living below that threshold. We're talking with Cassie Therfelder with us. She is the Director for Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And with that, Cassie, are you is the hope and the goal that our elected leaders will take this information and when they are making some of these policies around qualifications for goods and services, 
that this number comes into play because we do know there are some people that want to work, but they almost make too much to get services, but they're not making enough to actually make their ends meet. Yes, absolutely. That is definitely one of the things we want elected officials to consider, um, decision makers to consider. Um, that what you're talking about is that benefit cliff that we hear about all the time, right? Where you know people get to a certain point, they're making more, and then they lose some of those safety nets supports that they need, um, and then they're not able to keep working. And so there are, in addition to considering, you know, Alice threshold um, as um, the eligibility level for, for a lot of these support services, um, which we know can help families who are living below the Alice threshold. There are a number of other ways that we can support Alice households um, through, through policy changes. And those are things that we know support, help support that budget, help reduce the burden on Alice families. These are things like um, the earned income tax credit, for example, which we know in 2011 was cut from 20% down to 6% of the federal EITC. So if we increase the EITC back to its original 20%, that puts more dollars in the pockets of, of working Alice households, households that are struggling to get by. Um, so things like that can help you know, ease that burden, that financial burden on households. Another example is, is child care. So we know that child care is consistently the highest cost for a family or a household with children's budget. So that is true in every county in the state of Michigan. Uh, and we know that access to high quality early education is so essential for children to be set up to succeed um, for their whole lives. And so we want to make sure that everyone can access high quality, affordable early education and child care. Um, and this is also a workforce issue, right? Because if you don't have access to affordable child care, it can be difficult for you to work. Um, you know, it's... It, it's difficult for parents to make the decision to, to go work a job that barely pays enough to cover the cost of a child care bill. Um, and so that is something that we definitely ad, we want to advocate around is how can we reduce the cost of child care? How can we make child care more affordable for households throughout our region? But also taking into consideration that those, those individuals who are providing that care, that education, that essential service, for our um, households, those childcare providers are often living below the Alice threshold themselves. So also looking at like increasing reimbursement rates to make sure that providers themselves are, are lifted up above that Alice threshold. Um, so there are a number of different pieces, different ways that we advocate around this Alice report. So in putting the Alice report together, you have the information, you recognize the problems. Does it also offer advice or guidance on the solutions, or do we just start with at least identifying the shortcomings in our communities? So the report itself is more about providing that data, that information, so that everyone in our community can take that information and make those decisions about you know, what those next steps should be. Um, and I'll say, you know, United Ways throughout the state are, are doing that as well. They're looking at this data and thinking about you know, how can we use this to inform our decisions about things like grant making and our strategic initiatives, our programs, our services, what we're doing um, to improve the lives of those living below the Alice threshold. Um, so the report itself does not in really include any of those, you know, policy recommendations, but, you know, United Ways across the state do have those policy recommendations. And you, know, you, can, you can see more about our policy perspectives, the things that we're advocating on around Alice households by visiting standwithunitedway.org. Uh, we have, a, you know, all of our policy initiatives included there as well. We're talking with uh, Cassie Therfelder. She is the Director of Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. And uh, I think a lot of people in the community can recognize that there is a need and there is a gap, but some people are going to say opportunities are available for people to lift themselves up to get out of this situation. What's your response to that? I think a lot of times when we're looking at this Alice data, our initial reaction is to say, well, what we need to do is increase opportunities to higher paying jobs. Um, but from this Alice report, what we know is that more than half of all jobs in Michigan are paid hourly, and more than half of these jobs, of all jobs, pay less than $20 an hour. 
So there are opportunities for employment, but not necessarily opportunities for employment that will put you above that Alice threshold. Um, we know that before, you know, before the pandemic began, only 25% of all working age adults had the security of a full-time salaried position. And so that put them at this great risk when entering, you know, the pandemic. Um, so I think keeping in mind that, you know, there are definitely opportunities for us to, to support these households um, as they work to, to, you know, get new credentials or skills training, um, increase their degree attainment. Um, but for many of these households, there are barriers for things like childcare, transportation, um, and so providing wraparound services to help support households in accessing those programs is really essential, but also recognizing that, again, you know, more than half of all jobs in Michigan are paying less than $20 an hour, and that is not enough to sustain, you know, a household budget. So true. Housing uh, in the area, especially around Detroit, is so expensive. I remember I went to college down south, and when I first came up to Detroit, I was like just sticker shocked at the cost of housing, which we know is such a huge part of people's budget. But uh, one of the things, too, I, I really wonder, um, it's going to be fascinating to see this report in two years with the pandemic, because we do know so many people have been forced out of the workforce because of remote learning with their kids. And we know that now we need uh, some of those vital tools include the internet and computers. And, you know, women have left the workforce at a higher rate than men. So now is a great time for this report to come out and really get our policymakers to pay attention to it. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, we're, we're very interested to see what impact COVID has had on our region um, in that next report. In the meantime, we do have some information about how households who are below the Alice threshold are impacted by COVID. Um, we know that, you know, these are households that many of them have, many of whom have children um, that didn't fully recover from the Great Recession. As we talked about, you know, costs are rising faster than wages, and all of our wages, and many of our wages are concentrated in those low wage jobs um, and jobs that more often do not include health benefits or sick time. And so, you know, Alice households are more vulnerable to crises of all kinds from, you know, natural disasters to this current pandemic because they aren't able to have that financial cushion, that financial safety net. Um, and that is what's needed um, when you go into a crisis like this pandemic. And we also know that, you know, these, many of these Alice households are people who are on the, the tightest budgets and they're navigating that complex web of benefits and eligibility. And they're working multiple jobs in many cases just to tread water. And these are the same COVID-19 essential workers who are stocking grocery shelves. They're making and delivering food, keeping essential municipal services running and caring for our loved ones. Um, and what's really interesting is, is if you visit uh, unitedforalice.org, you can see uh, the COVID-19 data overlapped on the Alice uh, data as well, and really see how um, COVID-19 is specifically impacting Alice households. Cassie Therfelder with us here on the Mega Cash. She's the Director in Advocacy and Government Relations for the United Way of Southeast Michigan. Uh, fascinating work and very important work as well, Cassie. And we know United Way has been, again, such an important part of the community and helping so many people, not just in the pandemic, but uh, previously for decades as well. Anything maybe I didn't touch on that you want to add before we say goodbye to you? Um, I think I just want to, you know, say that I know that this data, you know, can be um, heartening. Uh, but hope is not lost, and there are ways that together we can we can make an impact. We can do something about this. So um, make sure to share this information with people you know. Tell your elected officials your story. Let them know what policies are creating barriers for you, and you know what issues you're experiencing. Um, and again, you can you can join United Way's efforts to share this important information and these policy issues with our elected officials by visiting StandWithUnitedWay.org. We have to recognize the problem before we can fix the problem. So, Cassie, thank you for all your work on this as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Still a lot to get to in the second hour. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the Marketing and Communications Manager 
from one of our favorite hotels here in the greater West Bloomfield area. This is the Megacast. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development, three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Another full hour here on the Megacast. As a reminder, we're here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon live. After the show, though, you can always catch reruns of the shows. Do they still call it reruns, uh, Tyler? Yeah, we still call it reruns. We still call it reruns, repeats, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's always available for you. There you go. You can find it if you go to civiccentertv.com. Click on Megacast. There you'll find previous episodes of the show going all the way back to last March when they started the show. And then uh, if you just want to catch an individual interview, you can find that in the on-demand section. Uh, with that, uh, the hotel industry is another industry that has been extremely hard hit throughout the crisis, but they are starting to bounce back and they've done it with a lot of creativity. Joining us now on the show, Sarah Osborne. She's the marketing and communications manager for the Royal Park Hotel, one of our favorite hotels. How are you doing today, Sarah? I am well, how are you, Ronnie? Good, good. I, I always feel like your hotel isn't just a hotel. It's so much more. You know, it, it really is. We do feel a, a large sense of community here and a lot of community support. And we've really become a place of, you know, a getaway for people, a relaxation point, their um, kind of go-to spot their particular day of the week. So yeah, we have a lot that goes on here more than just the hotel. So with that, Sarah, we know, uh, you know, the world is starting to reopen. People are feeling more comfortable traveling. Um, are you seeing things pick up there at the hotel? So we are seeing things pick up uh, what we call transient guests. So the, the local traveler, that person within that 300 mile radius of our property are driving that few hours distance for long week or weekend getaways. Um, we are slowly seeing a small amount of our business travel pick up, but it's definitely not where it has been in years past. So we're very reliant on our local community and that three or four mile, uh, three or four hour radius travel. I mean, really, it's a perfect getaway for parents because we know so many families are stressed right now. So as more and more grandmas are getting vaccinated, send the kids to grandma and grandpa and get away for the weekend because people have they've earned it over the past year. Absolutely, and we have been doing a lot of unique, um, different activities and events here at the hotel to help draw in and provide opportunities for people who are looking to get away that are more than just a night stay. So I feel that one of the great things about your hotel really is the location as well because it does invite that getaway feeling in the middle of a city and um, talk about some of the plans and the programs that you've come up to try to attract people to come to your hotel. Absolutely. So downtown Rochester is just a few blocks from the hotel. We are situated right on the banks of Pink Creek River. So we really don't feel like we're in a big downtown suburban area, but it is just that few blocks walk to downtown. So we've developed some interesting room packages and connections more with our downtown to allow our guests to get that getaway feeling um, as if they were you know, more so up north or by the water. 
So we have a few different room packages. We have, um, for those to stay the night, we offer bike rentals. We offer fly fishing opportunities. So people who want to try their hand, the river is simply right there on the side of the hotel. Wait, you can fly and, fish here? I would never <laughs> We have fly fishing that. here, yes. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, and we, we've got a lot of bikes, uh, mountain bikes, uh, cruiser bikes, the Paint Creek Trails right outside the hotel, and then that connects to Clinton River and Macomb Orchard Trails. So there's truly almost 50 miles of trail connections right starting from our property. So it's it is like the feeling of up north, but right here in our own backyards. With that, we're talking with Sarah Osborne. She's a marketing and communications manager for the Royal Park Hotel located right there in Rochester. And with that, um, you guys are bringing concerts back. Yes, so we tried our hand last year at a concept called Vertical Concerts. We did four concerts last year. They went over really well. So this year we are actually hosting nine concerts this year. Our first one just took place this past Thursday. And oh, then the- how, um, how does it work? Yeah, so the concerts, there's two package options. The band sets up right on the side of the property, right by the Paint Creek River. And we have two package levels, one being more of a eye level seating on our restaurant terrace. And then the other package being an upstairs on our second floor, they go and have um, a space in our Luxury King Terrace guest room. It has a large walkout terrace and it has more of that aerial view of the concert. So you can bring guests with you. You get a room for the night and then you bring up to six guests total, including yourselves if you're sitting on the restaurant terrace or up to 10 guests in the upstairs level because it's considered a resident space following the MDHHS guidelines. It's really interesting and creative. Um, how's, what's been the response? Very successful. We were sold out for our first concert, so we were very excited for that. Um, you know, it, it's great because it's a night out. It's a way to safely gather with friends. You get to order your food, your beverages. Um, we have an, another option with cabanas. So for people who aren't maybe looking for that upper level experience, but want something a little bit more separated, but still outside. So we have the cabanas and a fire pit, um, a lot of different levels and opportunities for these packages. Okay, I have to know who came up with the name for the next concert series, the Jello Shots Vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> the concerts are named after the bands themselves. So the Jello Shots are based right out of Rochester, Michigan. So. Yes, that one is being close to sold out. We do have some availability left and, and some on our next concert, which is the Collision 6 on May 23rd. Well, that's quite the band name. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I think I'm getting old because I didn't know it was the name of a band. I was like, oh, you're going to be doing what? Different flavors of Jello shots? <laughs> Who knows? We could. <laughs> make it a part of the underlying theme plus you know you go on pinterest there are a world of new flavors of jello shots out there right now yeah. we're talking with sarah osborne she's the marketing and communications manager for the royal park hotel hey, uh, sarah if i can ask uh, how are things going um on the wedding front because you guys have a beautiful space for people to get married there is that picking up do you anticipate going into the summer and the fall so we're, we're hopeful. We, as everybody else, are, you know, monitoring the guidelines that are being set forth right now by the governor and um, MDHHS. So we are waiting patiently, you know, patiently and, and we're very hopeful that things will open back up more so this summer. We do have an outdoor pavilion, so that is available to book for events. Um, including weddings, as it is an outdoor space following current guidelines, and we're just monitoring closely for indoor opportunities. Um, so how does it work? Uh, did some people postpone their weddings to this year? Or many, yes, are you booked yeah. up? So many of our guests from last year did shift their dates to this year. Um, and then we are taking it week by week, day by day, to see what we can offer for them or continue to shift further. How hard has this been? Because, you know, in some cases, we had things that were um, restrictions that went in place like the night before. And just between us, Sarah, you could tell us, <laughs> did you have to deal with a few bridezillas over the past year? You know, I, I don't know if I'd necessarily call them bridezillas, but yes, absolutely. The, the, you know, imagining putting ourselves in their shoes, people that have built up this 
this vision and it's you know one of the most important days of their lives and to have that just ripped from underneath them of course is going to create um some frustration anger and of course it's it's nothing we can do so we're there to support the best we can but absolutely there there's always those trying times yeah and you know it's not your fault um you know but we have seen over the past year and it's just frustration Yes. Um, so many people. And so you have to try to rework it. But coming out of the pandemic, do you think some people are looking at how to have a wedding differently? Because in some cases, smaller is more meaningful and intimate. Absolutely. We've been seeing a lot of inquiries for smaller events, a lot of weddings that started out to be very large, that the most important thing to them is just to be married and, and, and have some of those family members that maybe are more elderly and, and not, you know, looking to be around for much longer. They want to just share that experience with them. So they're willing to do whatever they can and whatever it takes to still create that special day. Sarah Osborne with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the marketing and communications manager for the Royal Park Hotel. With that, Sarah, uh, can we talk about hiring and employees? We know sure. there is a shortage going yes. on right now. I would think you're hiring. Absolutely. As everyone is, um, definitely we are trying to think outside the box as I think many people are on hiring. It's a challenge because the pool of people is very small and the competition is very large um, because there are so few places that are not hiring. Um, we are actually working on launching a campaign uh, for hiring, and we're helping target with our current employees to help recruit and, and find people. So we're, we're giving some incentives to our current employees to find new people um, and trying to focus on really the who behind the why. Our, our motto is, you know, everyday luxury and wanting to provide that to our guests. So we're really just trying to find people that are looking for an exciting, new, different, fun place to work that care more about, you know, what it takes to take care of guests, to be more connected as a family, and not just that other number at a, at a job. We really are a family here. So uh, with that, what are the top positions that you need to try to fill? So right now, we really are across the board looking for a lot of positions. Our restaurant kitchen staff is one of the largest at this time from chefs to servers, banquet staff as events start picking up. We are looking for those staff members, a few at our front desk as well. It's kind of a great time and an opportunity for people to work under people with a great experience as well. Absolutely. There's, we're a very unique place because we have so much variety here that for people who are really looking to get into the hospitality industry, this is an amazing place and opportunity to dabble in a few different areas of the hotel and really advance your knowledge and your skills for the industry. So Sarah, do you anticipate um, as more and more people start to travel that there are still people that aren't comfortable, but they want to stay closer to Michigan because we've seen such a huge increase in our parks and our trails. And with your location, it's kind of the best of two worlds. Yes, absolutely. People are looking for that quick getaway where they just have to drive within the state, you know, a few hours or less, and they want something where they can be outdoors. So they want that experience where they can feel safe. And so that's why we've adapted a lot of our programs to really highlight the outdoors renting fire pits, renting cabanas, the bikes, all of that, to try and target those people who are looking to spend money and feel like they've had a vacation, but they haven't had to travel too far. Sarah Osborne with us here on the Mega Cast. Just another minute or two before we say goodbye to you, Sarah. Anything else going on over at the hotel that uh, you want to highlight? Yeah, so I guess for people who don't know, um, beyond the hotel and, and having you know rooms packages and the concerts, and um, you know events and things. We also have a restaurant. It has one of the largest terraces, really, in you know our area that overlooks the Pink Creek River. We've got a great bourbon program. We've got wonderful, amazing cuisine. We're actually launching our new restaurant menu tomorrow. So 
for those who are maybe interested in stopping by but not staying the night, we do have the restaurant as well. How much uh, of your visitors do you get that are local? Uh, right now, I would say 70, 80% of our guests right now are truly our, our local community. Wow. It, it goes back to support local mm -hmm. as well. Sarah Osborne with us here on the Megacast. If someone's coming to the restaurant, do they need to make reservations? We recommend it. It's not required, but absolutely with our 50% occupancy, you know, six people to a table, six feet apart. Absolutely. We highly recommend making those reservations. Well, it's been so great having you with us here on the show. Sarah Osborne, Marketing and Communications Manager for the Royal Park Hotel there in Rochester. Um, Sarah, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And good luck with the hiring because we need to remind people they're once they're going back outdoors or back to restaurants and hotels, they expect the same level of service, but they have to understand that so many businesses right now are experiencing shortages. Be patient and be kind. Absolutely. And, you know, people can find our information. They just go to our website, royalparkhotel.net. They can visit our careers page. It's easy application. Um, you know, give us a call. We're happy to chat. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. You too. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Still about uh, 45 minutes left in the show. A lot to get to. Still here on the show. When we come back, we are going to be speaking with the CEO of Dutton Farm. That's next here on the Megacast. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful. Because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Finally, I just got my COVID-19 vaccine. I registered with my local health department and they called me. I got mine at the pharmacy and my neighbor got hers from the hospital. I'm not a techie person, so I called the COVID hotline and they helped me schedule an appointment. Get vaccinated with the first vaccine you can. Protect us all. Learn more at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. with us here on the mega cast uh you can catch us on civic center tv birmingham area municipal access uh if you do have cable we want to say thank you a portion of your fee helps support programming such as this you'll find us on channel 15 if you have comcast 99 on at&t you can also listen to us on the radio so if you're out driving around 89.3 lakes fm 88.1 fm the biff and then we also live stream uh, today's edition of the Megacast on our Facebook page for Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. One of the great things that we get to do here on the show is not just try to inform you, but also to highlight some of the organizations and great people in our community. And uh, with that, we want to bring in Jenny Brown. She's the CEO of Dutton Farm and Everybody by Dutton Farm. Jenny, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I love your organization and the work that all of you are doing. But for those that aren't familiar with Dutton Farm, give us uh, the history. Sure. So um, Dutton Farm was founded in 2010. Um, it's located in Rochester and um, we serve the Tri-County area. So um, Wayne, Macomb, Oakland, but most of our participants are coming from Oakland County. Um, and I grew up in a big family. I have 14 siblings and my older sister 
um, is the gem of our family and she has Down syndrome. She's the third of the 14. And we all grew up really understanding what inclusion should look like. My friends hung out with her friends. I went to her cheerleading matches. She came to my basketball games. But then when I graduated high school, I started to notice the trajectory of both of our lives were going to look very different. And it, it was shocking to me because it was not what my household was like growing up. And so I did college. I played college basketball, um, got my bachelor's degree, and then really decided to do just a complete 180 in my career and started a nonprofit to um, give my sister something meaningful to do every day. And then um, we really just decided about three years in once we, we really realized how we could add value to this community um, that we were going to sink our teeth into um, workforce development, community access, and um, educational opportunities. So it's a personal journey. What yes. has it been like for you in the ability to bring awareness, um, but also to touch other lives? An absolute privilege. Um, the work that I have the opportunity to do every day is nothing but an absolute privilege and an honor. Um, the individuals that I get to work with, they are my teachers, they are my mentors, um, and they show me you know, always what's most important, and they're just the most incredible people to work with every day. The journey is hard, but it is a privilege. Um, it's certainly different. Not a lot of people understand the life that I live, but um, it is absolutely, absolutely 100% a privilege. So if we can kind of start with the farm. Is it a working farm? What is it like there every day? Yeah, so it is. It is a six acre farm. Um, and we believe that beauty is therapy. And uh, the, the farm is our community. Um, we access the community in a variety of ways, but um, we also know that the actual physical site of our farm is a community. And um, so we have chickens and sheep and bunny rabbits, and um, we have lots of raised beds. We have a fruit orchard and all of these different farming activities that really lend themselves very well to um, learning um, in a therapeutic environment, uh, skills that are transferable to the job market. Um, and so we have participants that show up every day. So pre-COVID, we had a census of about 100 individuals. We are not at full capacity at this time, obviously, with social distancing and safety first. Um, but we, we built a really incredible telehealth program um, for those that are not able to leave their homes yet so that no one has been left behind. Um, so uh, I'm sorry. So with that, Jenny, what has it been like for some of the ones that haven't been able to get to the farm? Really hard. You know, loneliness and mental health is something that um, we have to recognize as a byproduct of this pandemic. Um, when this first started, I did a lot of work dropping off PP PPE to local group homes um, and the staffing shortage was um, an absolute crisis. I would show up at homes where there was literally no one there, um, no PP PPE, no hand sanitizer, and it's just not something that was really talked about. Um, thankfully, um, Alyssa Slotkins, our Congresswoman, um, did a lot of work in making sure she secured um, support in you know, some of the, the, early, um, the early packages, gosh, the name of what the packages are um, escaping me, but that has made a huge difference for us and so many other providers. Um, with that, um, so now that we're, kind of coming out of, we hope, the back end yeah. of this pandemic, I feel like organizations such as yours may have even more work to do. Yeah, I think um, it took what would have been maybe a five-year plan and just put it in a pressure cooker and um, motivated us to work a lot more quickly. Um, we are a very innovative, groundbreaking program, always looking to evolve and figure out how to offer services to those who cannot access us. And um, we've built a really incredible telehealth program. And we also have built, are in the process of building a really cool um, virtual learning program for individuals with disabilities who graduate high school, 
but can't access maybe a college or a university and have trouble entering the workforce. So this, this kind of hybrid model that's brand new for people to be able to access this virtual learning program in partnership with the Pontiac Community Foundation. Um, so COVID kind of prompted us to really think about the future of educational opportunities for people with disabilities. So there's been those silver linings. Um, and you know, that's when, when things get hard and crisis happens, it's time for leaders to lead and to buckle down and to figure out how to survive, how to navigate and how to continue doing the work that they are um, supposed to be doing. That is, um, that really is going to be the beauty that comes out of this crisis. When do you hope to launch that? So we are in the thick of it now. It's really exciting, really cool. We're trying to find the most state-of-the-art accessible software um, that will make our services um, accessible to everyone that should need it. Um, but we're looking to launch January of 2022. So um, we have just decided on a platform. Now we're building the content and we have a really great team. It's actually funded by Chick-fil-A. Um, wow. So they gave us a, a really sizable grant December of last year. And we just, um, January of this year, just went to work. That's so great to hear. Jenny Brown with us here. She's the CEO of Dutton Farm and every body by Dutton Farm. And so with that, can we go back to the farm? Do you have enough workers now? Um, we, we actually, we do. We have experienced staffing shortages just like every other industry, everyone else, sure. But right now, actually, we're in a really good place. We've just are in the process of hiring five new positions, which is exciting all across our um, organization in different capacities. Um, but we are always looking for good direct support professionals, good job coaches, because without these important frontline workers, um, we're, we're stagnant, we're stalled. Um, and so to be able to successfully place people in um, competitively paid integrated work situations in the community, we need good job coaches. So uh, tell us more, uh, the farm, do you guys have like a market as well? Yes. So we actually, we have a hybrid model. So we have a, an L3C, which is a low profit limited liability company. So this is what you would, you would consider your social enterprise. And then we have our 501C3, which is the nonprofit. The nonprofit is the job training, the community access and the education. And then we have our, our market, which is everybody by Dutton Farm. And that is run solely and funded solely on the sale of our products. So that is the job opportunity. So this is a line of natural bath and body products that are manufactured and distributed by people with and without dis disabilities. So the goal is to show that a business can thrive while being inclusive. Are you selling those products online or do you have a storefront? Both. Yep. So um, we are we distribute through uh, a wholesale um, relationships online, direct to customer, and then through our POS system where people can show up and shop. So if you visit everybodyinc.com, you'll see our story, you'll see our employees, you'll see our products, and are able to shop. Jenny Brown with us here on the Mega Cast. She's the CEO for Dutton Farm and Everybody by Dutton Farm. And with that, Jenny, for what skill sets? do uh, some of your clients have that you're trying, what types of jobs are you trying to get them in? Sure, I'm so glad you asked that because so often there is a stigma that people with developmental disabilities really can be a greeter at Meijer or in you know custodial work. And that's just not true. Um, we place people in all different types of jobs um, and all different types of industries. And so um, from um, landscaping to childcare to sales to IT to horticulture to accounting to um, uh, customer service. It's all different types of work. We have um, the individuals that we work with um, placed in these types of jobs. Uh, we start with an individualized assessment and we really work on getting to know that individual specifically, letting them explore their gifts. What do they love to do? What are they good at? Instead of pigeonholing them in a position based on just an open job and what we think would be best. And that's allowed us to um, expand into different markets and industries that you know typically wouldn't be thought of for this population. So how important is it to try to educate the hiring managers and the business owners to open up their minds to hiring people with disabilities? 
incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, we really have to start thinking differently about how we recruit, look for, and onboard talent. Um, when we were, we were facing what pre-COVID, the unemployment rate was 3%, yet there is a group of people in the United States in 2020, 2020 at the time that were facing an 85% unemployment rate. Yet they all wanted to work. You know, they, there's reported that 75% of these unemployed individuals want to find work, but they can't access the training or the supports necessary to obtain employment. And so um, we have to stop thinking about hiring people with disabilities as charity, but as good business. And if you look at any of the studies that are done, companies that champion the cause of hiring people with disabilities outperform their competitors um, significantly. Jenny Brown with us here on the MegaCast. She's the CEO for Dutton Farms and everybody by Dutton Farm. Do you think right now could be a good time for people with disabilities to jump into the workforce? Because so many businesses are having shortages right now. Could this be an opportunity for them? I hope so, but I think it's just individualized. It depends on the individual circumstances, their vulnerability to COVID and you know their access to transportation and all of those kinds of things. But we're certainly working hard to do it. There's a lot of new industries that are up and coming. Um, the cannabis industry is something that is, um, uh, has a lot of opportunity for employment. And if there's opportunity, we're there scoping it out and working hard to develop. Jenny Brown with us on the Megacast. Jenny, just another minute or two with you before we say goodbye. Uh, anything more that we didn't maybe touch on that you wanna share? Um, I mean, of course, there's always a lot that I could talk about, but I think just understanding this idea of the power you have as a consumer and where you spend your money um, is like casting a vote for the kind of world that you want to see. And so as a consumer, I think before you make those purchases for your everyday lives, for us, it's, it's bath and body products, but there's so many other good mission focused companies that maybe are local um, and maybe our regional, uh, but think about where you spend your money and do that extra time to research, to realize that I'm spending my money and I could be impacting somebody's life, lives by spending money I already have to spend. So it looks like uh, you guys have so much work that you've done, but also where you hope to go. Yeah. Any thoughts of trying to make this a bigger platform? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think with our virtual learning platform, um, that's something that we see expanding, um, you know, throughout the state and beyond because it's virtual, right? And then with our brand, with our social enterprise, we'd love to see us become a regional brand and then grow nationally. Um, and so the more opportunity that we get, we just keep building and keep moving forward. What are some of the programs or classes that you'll be teaching virtually? So we'll do everything from soft skills interviewing, what to wear on an interview, um, to sales, landscaping, IT, marketing, um, all of those different industries that we're already involved in um, to give more opportunity for people to, to um, access that pipeline. So uh, you kind of uh, you know, uh, said my favorite word there, bath and body <laughs> products. <laughs> you know, I think we've all, uh, especially throughout the pandemic, kind of binged on so many of those products yeah. to make us feel better. This industry is growing so fast. It's so good for us. So with that, where can people find out more about the products and uh, maybe if they want to get something for Mother's Day? Yes, yeah, so we do have Mother's Day bundles running right now. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We always have updates about how our products are being made and our employees and what products we have, but also you can purchase at everybodyinc.com. Jenny Brown, we so appreciate your time, but we also appreciate the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. I appreciate being able to be here today. And best of luck and continued success uh, and everything that you all are doing there. So uh, again, Jenny Brown, CEO for Dutton Farm and everybody by Dutton Farm, please support uh, their work and uh, buy their products as well. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Megacast. When we come back, we're gonna be talking about the Detroit Free Press Marathon. It was canceled last year. What's it going to look like this year? This is the Megacast. 
COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not alone. You shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys. I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping, taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now there are vaccines and they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now, get the facts. Learn more at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Right now, our country feels divided, but there's a place where people are coming together. I was nervous to talk to someone so different than me. Me too. Love Has No Labels and One Small Step are helping people with different political views, beliefs, and experiences connect through conversation, and it feels good. This conversation gives me hope. It gives me a lot of hope, too. Take a step toward bringing our country and your community together. Start a conversation at lovehasnolabels.com slash one small step. A message from StoryCorps, Love Has No Labels, and the Ad Council. Over a decade ago, the journey to a COVID vaccine began. Building upon research on other coronaviruses, scientists continued with months of research and development, three phases of clinical trials with tens of thousands of diverse volunteers, then peer review and authorization to deliver a safe and effective vaccine that will protect all of us. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. Wearing a mask is more than protection. It's a bridge to better days. The path back to celebrations with family. Nights out on the town with friends. Game days with your favorite sports teams. And the thrill of live concerts. But until we can all get the COVID-19 vaccine and build community immunity, which will take time, we all need to continue to stay careful because Michigan's recovery is depending on you. And so are your family, friends, and neighbors. So even after you're vaccinated, wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, and social distance. One day in the near future, we will all be able to put this pandemic behind us. But until then, spread hope, not COVID. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. In times like these, we have to believe in each other. And we believe that you'll do the right thing. When it comes to stopping the spread of COVID. Follow the three W's. Wear a mask. Wash your hands. Watch your distance. And when it's your turn to get the vaccine, take your shot. It all comes down to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We're so close, Michigan. We can do this together. Quitting smoking can improve your health, but it also protects your loved ones from secondhand smoke. Did you know there's no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke? Smoke from cigarettes, e-cigs, and hookah can travel through ventilation systems and harm those around you. So clear the air and stop secondhand smoke. Call the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line at 1-800-784-8669. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I want to get back to seeing my grandbabies every Sunday and smothering them with big hugs and kisses. I want to get back to football games with my boys. I want to get back to feeling and touching, connecting with the people around me. I want to get back to family dinners and my grandma's mac and cheese. I want to get back to real grocery shopping, taking my time, walking down every aisle, smelling the tomatoes and melons, having a free sample or two or three. COVID-19 has changed how we live and how we feel. But now 
There are vaccines, and they are the first step that let us get back to feeling optimistic about the days ahead of us. It's okay to have questions. Is it safe? Should I get it? Should I wait? Now, get the facts. Learn more at GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision when vaccines are available to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios. Tyler Keith holding things down for us back there in West Bloomfield. Uh, rounding out the show today for so many people, the Free Press Marathon has become a family tradition. But 2020, the race was canceled. It's back on for 2021, but what is it going to look like? Joining us now on the Megacast, Barbara Banach. She is there, or Binage. It's Binage, right, Barbara? It is, but Banach sounds so much cooler. <laughs> well, you can go ahead and adopt it if you want. I do, I do. Sometimes I call myself Babs Banach, just to be <laughs> even cooler. <laughs> I like that. I like that. You're the executive race director for the Detroit Free Press Marathon. And Barbara, I, last year must have been so hard for you and your team because it takes a lot to put on one of these races. Absolutely. I mean, we start, you know, the year before even putting, thinking about, you know, 21 or 22. Um, we're even thinking about 23 right now. So it does. It takes you know, years to, to plan it. Um, obviously, we work with Canada because we're an international race in the city of Detroit. So it takes a lot of planning, a lot of work. Um, and so, yes, last year was a bit of a disappointment. We don't like to say that we were canceled. We just like to say that we went virtual instead of a live race. Um, that keeps us within our, you know, celebrating our 44th year this year. We didn't want to skip a year because we want to keep that momentum going. I do like that because some people still ran it. They did it just virtually. Yeah, absolutely. We had, I don't know, over nearly 4,000 virtual runners from all across the, the world. I always wonder about some of the virtual races. Um, I've taken part in some of them, and it really is for the medal. <laughs> it's all about the medal, Barbara. It's all about the medal. And uh, I wonder, were there times faster, slower, or, you know, Maybe they didn't really do the whole thing. You know, that's okay. You know, get out there and move. That's all we really cared about. Um, obviously, we can't time a virtual race. And so it's it's on your honor to do, do the best that you can. It is lonely to run 26.2 miles, which is a full marathon. And even lonely to run a half marathon at 13.1. But if you have your friends and family out there, um, you know, cheering you on and and making it a good time for you, it, it all turns out in the in the in the long run, so to speak. So, what does it look like this year? Because um, so, some of the people that were signed up for 2020, if they decided mm -hmm. not to take part of the virtual race, did their registration from last year transfer to this year? In a, in a roundabout way, they got a deferral code in which they have to re-register. So they using their deferral code, they have to re-register, which pretty much almost everybody has so so far. There's maybe 25% that has not yet. Um, uh, so, and, and plus we have the new runners. So this year we gave an option to sign up for a live in-person race or to run virtual for those that didn't want to uh, join several thousand people um, at our start and finish line. So it's looking okay. We're optimistic. Um, we've had meetings with um, city officials and health departments and our uh, medical provider, Henry Ford Health Systems. And, you know, as you know, the state is slowly opening back up. And so we are optimistic that in five and a half months, we'll be able to run on the streets of Detroit and hopefully, hopefully in Windsor. And that's uh, was going to lead me to my next question, because for so many people, the reason why they do like the free press marathon is it is an international race. It's one of the few. Yes. And um, I could never do a full marathon, but I have done the half a couple times. The view going over the ambassador bridge is amazing because you run under the sun is coming up and you, the American flag and then the Canadian flag. What happens this year? Because as of right now, the border is closed. 
Yes. So that your description just gave me goosebumps because um, <laughs> it is it is an amazing view. And that's probably the uh, the best thing about our race. There's many, many, many things. But that is the ultimate, you know, watching that sunrise. Um, honestly, Ronnie, we don't know yet. Um, you know, we, we're waiting. You know, the border says they're going to open May 21st or look at opening on May 21st. If they don't, we'll move it to June. And it's at one point, we'll have to make a decision to run U.S. only. I know many people will be disappointed, but it's certainly um, not anything that we can control. And we can't control anything. We can't control the COVID. We can't control what the state is or city is telling us to do or how the border is being affected. So a lot of things are out of our control. Um, we'll just have to roll with the punches. And But we are developing a U.S. only course. And I think people want to get back to running and they want to get back to running in a normal, you know, um, atmosphere with a lot of people and a lot of fanfare. And yes, it'll be disappointing if we cannot go into Canada, but I think we'll see different parts of Detroit that people may not have ever seen before. Barbara Benich with us here on the Megacast. She's the executive race director for the Detroit Free Press Marathon. And uh, Barbara, is it sold out registration? Is it, I'm sorry, the question is it again? sold? Is the registration oh, no. sold out? So there's still no, no, spots. no, no, there are definitely still spots. And, you know, we have several distances. We have a full marathon, a half marathon, a five person team relay, a 5K, a one mile and a kids run. So if, you know, if you're not a marathoner, that's OK. Get out there and, and get moving and do the one mile or challenge yourself to do a 5K, which is 3.1 miles. We just want you out there moving and experiencing um, the race in itself. So one of the good things, it is uh, in October. So we have a few months to mm -hmm. hopefully figure things out. And with the vaccinations, it looks like it's going to get better. Because I am wondering too, if, if you are able to um, do it, uh, be able to allow people to run over the border, are vaccinations going to be required, do you anticipate? We don't know that yet. Um, there are some races that are requiring that. We haven't made that decision yet. It's a big decision to make. And it's a big, I mean, just because, so everyone would have to be vaccinated. Any, any person that comes in contact with the race, not only just the runners, every volunteer, every, every staff member, um, every vendor. Um, so we're logistically, we're working, uh, looking at how to manage that. So we haven't made that decision yet. And, it, you know, I, I encourage everybody to get vaccinated and it is a personal decision. So we will uh, continue to keep our, our participants informed of that and give plenty of time for them to get vaccinated because it could take up to six weeks by the time if you have the two shots and you have to wait your, you know, two weeks afterwards. So we'll give people plenty of time, but we haven't made that decision yet. So what's it like to try to plan this year's race? Is, <laughs> do you have a flow chart going? Like, if this happens, we go this way. If this happens, yes. we go this way. Yes, it, it, we definitely do. We definitely do. And, you know, and then working from home and not being able to be all together and brainstorm on a whiteboard is, it makes it that much more challenging. Um, we have a very small team. Um, um, so, uh doing our Zoom calls or Teams calls on a daily basis and, and meeting to talk about, okay, the what ifs and what if we do this and our, you know, what are, are we going to defer to 2022 or, you know, all these different scenarios that we have to come up with. Um, it's challenging, but we've never faced this type of challenge before. So it's also um, a good learning experience. So Barbara, we know it, typically there's about what, like 19,000 runners? Mm, 26. 26,000 26, wow. in all of those distances. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that, um, that's just the runners. How yes. many people does it take? Because it, when you're talking about the volunteers, but also, mm -hmm. you know, people don't understand that maybe have never been to the race. You have people standing on the sides of the roads, cheering people on bands, and it really helps motivate all of the runners what is that team like and trying to get that side of this equation settled before the race? Yeah. So are you talking like in a, in, 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 in this type of a year or in a normal year? <laughs> in in a would, normal year, 
in a yeah, normal, in a normal year, year would you be pounds. pretty much done with that right uh yeah pretty much um you know gig, we don't really start recruiting volunteers in a normal year until june or july even august because people aren't thinking about what they're going to do in october um, but by obviously by October, it's all buttoned up and all of our bands are in place and all of our fluid stations are in place. And we use about 3000 volunteers to do everything from our start and finish and our, you know, all everything that's out on the course, including course marshals that tell you which direction to go to. Um, this year, uh, we really haven't really started recruiting volunteers or anything yet because we just don't know. Um, what's happening. So like I said, we are optimistic that we will have an in-person race. Is it going to look different than a normal year? Yes. How? We don't know yet. Um, like let's uh, fluid stations, for instance, we have anywhere from 25 to 60 volunteers at a fluid station. We don't think we can do that and be, and be socially distant. So it may look completely different to the runner. Um, but still working through all those logistics and details. And as, like I said, as we continue our talks with the health department and Henry Ford Health System, we are developing plans and, and, and trying to, going to make things work. Yes, it will look different. Well, I know that um, I'm signed up for the half and it will not be hard for me to be socially distanced because I'm <laughs> at the back. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and when I did it before my, you know, you could put the saying on your bib, mine was beat the bus. Because, yeah. <laughs> because if you're Excellent. so slow, uh, the bus will come around and pick you up. So, yes, um, they will. but still when you're looking at doing a race of this size and, you know, of course the great thing is, is it is outside. Um, but on top of that, it's very hard to socially distance uh, that many people. Yes, yes. So we're looking, you know, we're looking at other races and how they are doing the corrals. And a corral is where you line up according to your pace. And, and Ronnie, you said you're in the back. I don't know if I totally believe that, but <laughs> you line up according to your pace. And a, a corral can hold as much as as many as 2000 people. Um, obviously that can happen. So we're working at how many a corral can hold, how long will it take somebody to cross the start line, you know, socially distanced. Um, and we have time constraints too. So um, when we, if we can go into Canada, we have to be through the Detroit Windsor Tunnel by 10 a.m. Um, so we're looking at all of that. We don't think we're going to have 26,000 people or or basically on Sunday, which is the marathon and half marathon and relay, it's about 20,000 that line up at the start line. The other 6,000 or so run on Saturday in the 5K and the other distances. I don't, you know, I don't know if we can have 18,000 people on at the start line, but we hope we can. Um, but again, again, we have the socially distance and how to work a wave and a corral and get people across that start line. Barbara Benich, or Benich with us here, Executive Race Director for the Detroit Free Press uh, Marathon. And uh, Barbara, with that too, uh, for people that maybe are hesitant, they want to sign up, they haven't done it yet, what do you want them to know? Uh, go with your gut. Go with your gut. I mean, we will keep registration open as long as we can. If you're not comfortable registering now, that's okay. We get it. Um, we get it. Um, and then that's happening across the board in all of the running industry. Um, and, and if you wait for the information, we give an update every single month on, on what our plans are. It's kind of been an update that is we are still planning on an in-person race. And, and as we get closer, we have things that we have to purchase. For instance, metals, which is the most important thing to you. Um, right. and, that those takes, and those take some time to get here. So we have to make some decisions and the decisions are gonna come up very fast. Um, but like I said, we are opti optimistically gonna have a live race. Well, fingers crossed that, um, yes. you know, we're able to do so because it really is, uh, it's a tradition, but I would anticipate you after the year that we've had, it could be a huge milestone for so many people to get out there and to run a race, even if it is the 5K, Absolutely. just Absolutely. get outside, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. run the race. 
Exactly. And and we're watching other races, you know, Boston, which is typically in April, they move to October and Chicago is still planning on their October race. And the New York is planning on their November race. So we're, we're watching all of these races and what they're doing and the protocols that they're taking. So we're a, a, we're a very tight knit group of race directors in the industry. So we share ideas and, and we come together on meetings and talk about best practices. So um, we're, we're, up, we're up to speed on everything that we're doing. I was really surprised to learn that uh, this race used to actually start in Canada. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, we started in Windsor. It used to be run on Belle Isle. Um, five or six laps on Belle Isle in the early days. It used to be called the Motor City Marathon. Um, and then the Detroit Free Press acquired it in 1978, and we wanted it to go international. Um, and we wanted to use the bridge and the tunnel, and we weren't allowed to use the bridge at that time. So we started, we bust everybody over into Canada, and then we finished on, and we came through the tunnel, not use the bridge, and then we finished on Belle Isle. So we bust everybody to Canada, and then from Belle Isle, we bust everybody back to the the, the um, parking lots near the Renaissance Center. I don't think the Renaissance Center was built at that time, but may have been. Um, but that was the early days where it was just only a marathon. Um, so we had, you know, 4,000, 5,000 runners, and that was pretty good back in the day. And back in the day. Um, yeah, so it started in Canada. And then we, we brought the bridge in about 20 years ago. Yeah, about 20 years ago, we brought the bridge in and started here in Detroit and then obviously did the bridge and through the tunnel. Really, re- really unique. It is so unique. And it's, uh, like I said, it's very sought after so many people from across the country. I know the few times I've done it, you really do get people from all over that we come do. to run we do. this race. And so a lot of planning goes into it and you and your team do an amazing job. What's this been like for you though, this entire journey? Because are you a runner? Do you have a race background? I have a little teeny tiny race background, basically running to have a mimosa afterwards. So <laughs> I have I have never done a full marathon um, or a half marathon. I do the 10Ks or 5Ks. And um, yeah, my, my sport is golf. So that's where I take out my, you know, that's where my fun is. But um, being in the running industry um, since 1989 and doing this, um, I think this will be my 30th or so marathon that I've been involved in. Um, it's, it's been different. It's, it's been, like I said, working from home and not being together and, you know, trying to figure out what we're going to do. It's been different, challenging, but again, a great learning experience. Well, I know if uh, you guys can pull it off, if anyone can, you and your team can, and it will be appreciated by uh, so many people. And I will say I started with the 5k um, we did a mm-hmm. 5k a month for a year. And mm-hmm. then uh, I saw the medal. It was the ribbon because the half marathon <laughs> and, and uh, marathon runners, they had the much cooler ribbon. And I was like, oh no, next year I'm running. The yeah. half just be- It's all about the medal. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. The bling as we call it. And, you know, our medal has won many awards um, for being very creative and, and, and really blinged out. Um, you know, it's pretty hefty and, it's a, it's a pretty nice medal. So I appreciate your support though, Ronnie, and running us for a couple of years. That's great. Well, I will say it's been a few years since I did it and I swore I would never do it again. And here I am uh, signed <laughs> yeah, up, but yeah. then uh, uh, actually fell and uh, fractured my ankle. So I'm a little late in oh. training. So I really will be the back of the bus. So <laughs> that's okay. That, just don't get on the bus. <laughs> right. So with that, but I'm with you on the mimosas afterwards. Uh, that is my yep. post race <laughs> celebration every year. Uh, again, if people want to still sign up, what's the cost? Because I know that typically it goes up at certain points. Yeah. In- yeah. You, you asked me a tricky one because I don't have all of those embedded in my head. It's, I, I want to say about 110 for the full marathon and maybe a hundred for the half, but don't, don't quote me on all that. But if you want more information, you can go to freepmarathon.com. That's F-R-E-E-P marathon.com. And it has, you know, the link to registration and all of our prices and all of our information, including COVID-19 updates. Yeah, you, uh, it looks like you got the, um, 
the price is right. So you're good to go. Good to go there. <laughs> so everyone, thank you again for everything that you do because it really is a tradition and puts us on the map. Uh, Barbara yeah. Benich with us. She's the executive race director for the Detroit Free Press Marathon. We appreciate your time. That's going to wrap it up for the Tuesday edition of the Megacast. We'll be back here bright and early tomorrow at 10 a.m. This is the Megacast.